I think the void is, again, it's the space where we store all of the stuff. It's the space where we get to reflect on all of the stuff. It's part of the being. It's the slowing down. It's the sloth energy. Again, when you take an approach to life as the hare versus the turtle, there's great achievement that may come from that, but it's very fleeting. And for me now, I am full blown embraced in the void. I, you know, I now serve ceremonial cacao. I said, all right, you know, again, I like physical manifestation of anything. Sit down and watch the pace that a sloth moves. You have to have the utmost patience. All right, welcome to Euphoric Evolution, where we are transforming leaders into legends. Today, I have Kyle Brown with me, who has actually been um, interviewed by me before. We've had conversation before that does still exist on YouTube. I did make sure um, to have the team make sure that it's listed because it was unlisted for a while. So now it's back out there. And I think that if anyone after this wants to go back and dig a little bit more and see your evolution, they can go back in there. But I want to start by saying, welcome, Kyle. And can you just share a little bit about yourself? Ah, wow. And and I want to be one of the ones to go back and look at it because I'm sure the guy who did that interview was a totally different version of me than the guy sitting in front of you today, which is amazing. Uh, I, I've had so many different versions in the last few years alone. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. But uh, best way I would say I could describe myself is that I am a defiant to adulthood, big kid who gets to play and live a life of his dreams. And I'm slowly evolving what that looks like every day. So I started out as a guy who was all ambitious, setting so many different goals and achievements and conquering and devouring and expanding. And now I'm a guy who is very happy and playful and joyful and uh, in the moment. Yeah. It's been really fascinating. We met in, was that 2019? I think it was 2019. Mm -mm. Um, I think it was 2018. 18. Oh yeah. It was the fall of 2018. Yeah. It was fall of 2018 because the near-death experience was January 19th. Yeah, yeah. So you had um, this really incredible experience. And we're not going to force everyone to go back and watch that other video. So let, can you just share a little bit about this? these like three stages? So there's who you were, then there was the near-death experience. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? What were you doing before January 2019? And then right. what started shifting? So I will say I was the type of guy who was heavily in his masculine, both divine and wounded, if you will, for context's sake. And I was pushing and hustling and striving for this achievement of the life I want, the business I want the body I want, and people would always define me as this fitness wellness guy. I'd had an ESPN radio show. I had worked with 50-something celebs and pro athletes and rock stars and rap stars and their wellness. And for well over 20 years, I was like the epitome visually of health. So I was 5% body fat year round. And most of the questions then that would be asked to me was based on this human shell and people just saying, how do you do it? How can I do it? And I wasn't sleeping much because I was so structured and disciplined and always hustling, getting up early to you know win my day first. And in January of 19, January 2nd specifically, I get sick and I hadn't even had a cold in five years. And so all my mental toughness training, I'm like mind over matter, 
let's just overcome all of this. And I persevered through it. And about 10 days in, I'd been FaceTiming with different family members who are docs and a couple of friends who are ER docs. And finally, they're like, hey, looking at where you're at right now, you need to go get a chest x-ray. Long story short, I end up going in and they end up racing me into the ER for this chest x-ray. And when they did the chest x-ray, they called a code over the mic. They said, code sepsis. And I was like, that's interesting. Who's that for? And the nurse goes, you. <laughs> and that's when the mind over matter kicked in. And I realized how incredibly sick I was. And I just collapsed. And at that moment, they used every antibiotic in the book, even though I've been a natural health practitioner for 20 years. And I'm just like, all right, I'm just surrendering. And I really started that surrender process. I'm in the ICU and I got to put all these different bits and pieces into play. And I ended up getting a very clear message. And the message was basically like, you're, you're not on path. You're not, you're not living and being this person that you want to be. So things are going to be shaken up really strong now. And you have to choose, you know, do you want to stay? And if you want to stay, this is the type of path you're going to step into, or do you want to head on out? And I definitely wanted to stay. I had no intention on leaving, but I do feel that was, you know, one of many spiritual deaths that have happened since where I had to step into this other version of myself. And for almost a three year period, anything about me that was masculine and systematized and go-getter was just shut down. Kind of everything shut down during that recovery phase. And uh, fortunately, I had uh, a really funny friend named Makosi who I was able to connect with, who was able to help guide me through that experience. <laughs> As I begged every day for clarity, <laughs> I think I wanted clarity more than some people uh, want Big Macs and fries from McDonald's. <laughs> or a million day. dollars, right? <laughs> or a million dollars. I would have taken clarity over a million dollars at any moment. I was like, screw money. I'm like, just give me clarity, please. Yeah. This pea soup fog approach is not working. You know, yesterday I was doing, um, I was being interviewed by Claire Wood on her podcast and, and we were talking about these kinds of you know, really drastic near death experiences. I, I had one myself after giving birth uh, to Aiden where developed postpartum preeclampsia. My, my blood pressure was almost, I, I should have been in a coma and I ended up spending, you know, five days in the hospital trying to recover from that. And uh, she was sharing about a, an accident that she had had last year. So she's kind of still in the thick of it, right? And you had this near-death experience, which was really interesting because, you know, on the surface, right, looking at you, you were the absolute picture of what it means to be fit, what it means to be healthy, so on and so forth. And then we see you in in ICU, right? Like, hospital bed, not functioning at all, seemingly like, like that, like overnight. Right. And I just have a question for you. Do you feel like, look, like looking back retrospectively, do you feel like you were getting some nudges before getting hit over the head with a four by four <laughs> by your, by your higher self? <laughs> Was there nudges that you were just ignoring oh. before that? Unquestionably, it's just like dating, right? Why did that bitch leave me? It's like, how many times did she nudge you to shift, to change, to evolve, to be the guy you were when you were courting her in the first place? And you're surprised that she finally walked out the door? It's like, I think in general, we are always getting messages, nudges, awareness to shift but if we're hard headed and we're not pliable and we're so focused on achieving something, we, we miss the messages. I, I had that with happen with uh, our meal replacement shake company, right? I had so much of my identity wrapped around the idea of being the CEO of this meal replacement shake company that we were selling in Whole Foods and, and it was all ego driven. 
And when I finally let that illusion dissolve and just surrendered and let it go, I was talking with one of our investors who actually happens to be my uncle. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I know you drink this every day. I know you love this product, but I'm like, it's, it's time to close it. And he goes, I've been telling you this for eight years. I had that business for 17 years and he's been telling me for eight years. He's like, I've been telling you this for eight years. And every time you're prepared with some form of a sales pitch about why you're turning the ships and why things are changing and why this is so good. And they were great pitches. And so we kept it going. He's like, I love it, but let it go. And that whole illusion, I'm like, I never heard you say that once. He's like, because you weren't listening. <laughs> Funny how that works. Like, that wasn't even a nudge. It's it was literally being said directly to you, but you couldn't hear it because you were that right. attached. That's exactly right. We are attached to our labels, to our identities, to different ego-driven pieces of ourselves that we just won't let go. And... There's this saying that people say all the time in the personal development space, keep digging. You're just three feet from gold. It's huge. It's been said forever from Tony Robbins mentors down through now. And what I realized was, no, I'm not three feet from gold. I'm almost six feet in the grave. <laughs> <laughs> and if I would have kept digging, I would have been gone. For what? I was digging for the wrong treasure. Yeah. That wasn't even the treasure I actually wanted. Mm. So true. So true. Um, for sure, we need to. I'm, I'm reading your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Dad joke. Yeah. More like rad joke. <laughs> you are very well known yes. for your dad jokes. And, but also oh, yes. sometimes one liners, right? You weren't three feet from gold, you were more like six feet. <laughs> into your grave, right? Because what you were, what you were building, it's not that it wasn't good. It's not that, I mean, I used it. It was, it was very good. One of the absolute best uh, meal replacement shakes that I've ever experienced. And I'm sad because it's very hard to find a replacement for it. PS still working on that. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily your destiny. It wasn't your gift to bring into this world. And it was holding you back in so many other ways. I wanted to, I want to hit on something that you said. We're going to rewind for a second because you had this, this very specific experience that I see happen a lot. And I think how you have come full circle has been really interesting. So you mentioned that before your like close to death illness, you were so far in the masculine, in the yang energy. But after your near death experience and after we started, after we connected and, you know, I started mentoring you in, in a, in a spiritual um, aspect you had this drastic swing. Can you share with us a little bit about what what was that swing like from masculine into feminine or from yang into yin and where you are now? Absolutely. I think there was uh, only one other time in my life where I was that much in my feminine and it was my second semester sophomore year of college. I lived with five women who were on two cycles. So I would catch myself in one at one time and one at the other. My physiology may not have changed, but I felt them. <laughs> so <laughs> what I've, what I noticed was this is hindsight. Again, I, I like to say that back to my one liners that, uh, hindsight's 2020, but foresight can be pea soup fog. And in the foresight, I, just didn't know. And I actually feel like that makes the game of life so much more exciting is the not knowing is the adventure. And in the hindsight, as I look back at it, I needed, I'm an experiential learner. And I think there's probably many of you listening right now who are like, Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> I like to learn one, one experience at a time, not from the books. I don't want to go ask the librarian, Hey, tell me about Italy. I want to go to Italy and go experience it and talk to the 
you know, Italians who've been living in these villages and hear about their experiences and then emulate. So for me, I needed to experientially learn the conscious concept of you are not your body, you are a spiritual being having a human experience. Because so much of my identity was wrapped up in you are your body, you are what you eat, right? From everything fitness to clinical nutrition to mindset, including you are your nutrients, you are your movement, you are your thoughts, everything like that. It was very tangible and cerebral. And I needed to learn you are not your body. So the shift was literally pendulums here. And as we held it here, it built up all this stored kinetic energy. It went woo, right over into the feminine, both divine and wounded. And again, I'm not a big label person, but I, I was pretty deep in those uh, ideologies. And what that meant was for me, I spiritually took off like a rocket ship. And that was, I know, very fun for you because my dedication, determination, energy that was focused towards personal development was just an extreme openness to there is no level of weird that is too weird. And all of those things were actually a piece of me when I was a little kid, which was really nice. And just getting to bring those things back was was awesome. I was very tapped in. I have very spiritual relatives who are uh, you know, everything from channels to shamans to you name it. And all of that was stuff that I had just suppressed. So what happened was on the positive side, my tapping in and exploration and doing the doings of the things that, and being the beings of the, <laughs> of the ways that you would describe, I stepped fully into all of those. And that was beautiful. On the more challenging side was because I didn't have clarity and because I did not have trust in myself or confidence, I became a very easy to manipulate target. And there are a few people who were working in the energies of the ends justify the means, uh, if you will, took big advantage of me from business partnerships to mentors to whatnot. And I became very a very easy target to be easily manipulated where uh, I didn't have the discernment. I didn't know how to, like in the animal kingdom with raccoons, you say they wash their food, right? I didn't know how to take the pieces that worked for me and throw the rest out, nor did I have boundaries or the ability to stand up for myself. So that journey was very interesting and mixed. And then the other side that was very interesting with that is there is a lot of benefit to divine masculine energy because I was getting all of these different people who were stepping up to help me with other forms of mentorship and I couldn't do anything. They're like, okay, by Wednesday, I want you to have this and this and this done. And then we'd meet on that Wednesday. I'm like, I didn't do shit. <laughs> And that was so unlike me. Everybody before would be like, he's dedicated, he's determined, he gives 110%. He doesn't know what 99% is. Yet I would have these meetings like with brand manager and she's like, why are you getting nothing done? And why are you giving me all these excuses? And I'm like, I can't. And that wasn't months. That was like three years of no momentum. And it was like the train was just firmly rooted, like with tree, you know, like a tree, but it was supposed to be a train. But I guess it wasn't. I needed to learn that so I could then guide others through it. Again, I'm an experiential learner. Yeah, it's funny because you, you mentioned you're an experiential learner. And there was there was no amount of, even though you would ask me, <laughs> Makosi, just just tell me, just give me, <laughs> just, just give me. And I'm like, even if I did, you're not going to get it because you need to go through the experience of it to know what it, what it feels like to have discernment, what it feels like to develop, um, sight, right. The ability to see, and feel what is aligned for you and what isn't aligned for you. I can tell you all day long what that what that feels like, but the sometimes one of the best ways to know is 
to have the experience and then be able to gather the data. And I see a lot of people who, well, number one, I've definitely been accused of like, oh, you're a divine feminine teacher. And that I'm most certainly not. And I actually have a lot of, of yang or masculine energy. It's just that the people that I'm here to serve, the people that I'm here to support and, and expand tend to like have the masculine in overdrive. And so <laughs> we have to bring some of the yin, some of the feminine in, in order to bring harmony, right? Not balance. Balance. I, I don't like to use balance because balance infers that, oh, there's like a specific amount of masculine that you should be. And there's a specific amount of feminine that you should be. But really it's about uh, shape shifting. It's about having such mastery over your energy that you're able to tap into, okay, in this moment, in this space, in this experience, I need access to my yang energy. I need my, my, um, my, my ability to build or to, you know, commit to a deadline or take the leadership role. Right. And then sometimes you also need to be able to surrender and receive and, 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 and that was something that you were really struggling with. What does, how does, how do you show up with energetic harmony now? on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, great question. Well, as you know, I made my entire business about it. <laughs> That's where I was going with this. <laughs> right? That's, I think at the end of the day, as I was like, all right, I need to lead by example and embody all of these things to be able to hold that energetic space for people. Because it's really funny. Like if, if I look back at what you said and, and, and where I was at, if you would have come to me on your wellness journey, and said, all right, Kyle, here's the deal. I know I eat all this Southern food. I know I have no interest in exercise. Can you do it for me? I'll pay you whatever you want. <laughs> you, I would have been like, no, <laughs> I'll charge you double and not do it for you. <laughs> like it would have been so nonsensical. Like I can't, I can't do the pushups and transfer it over to your body yet. We haven't figured that out. I'm sure AI will one day. <laughs> but but I can't do that. And I also can't eat for you and have it change your body. We haven't figured that out yet. So it's you've got to walk through the fire yourself. So you're spot on, right? And I think for me right now, it is truly daily awareness and rituals. And it's fluid. It's uh, harmony isn't 50, 50, 40, 60. You, we are fluid beings that need to adapt to the environment. And in some moments in time, we need to truly evoke masculine structure of doing and organizing. And then we need to sometimes just sit back and observe and visualize and, and create and get, get clarity on where we're even going. And I realize most people, um, they're so far down the doing rabbit hole that they don't even know where they're going. <laughs> they don't even know where they want to go. They're like, how come my numbers in my bank account say this, but I'm actually not happy at all? Or how come I got the girl and the kids or the guy and, you know, the kids of my dreams and I'm not happy? Like, I've achievement based happiness doesn't work. And I think a lot of people are at that stage where they're like, uh, okay, I am so out of balance there. And women in so many cases, because of the patriarchal system, it's not like they're heavy into that divine feminine of, of flow. Oftentimes, They've shut off their feminine and gone so hard into the masculine that it's like having them step on the brakes for a minute and find their own inner harmony is so valuable. It's just, it's mind blowing that we are, you know, it's not just your friends, but all of our outside influences shift how we show up. 
And sometimes like for me, what I do is I just sit back and say, I made a conscious decision of, all right, it's so much easier to show up as Kyle, regardless of environment, because the best thing about that is I, life is so complicated enough as is, I don't have to remember who I told what. I don't have to remember what image or persona I've created. It's not like, okay, now I put on my dad hat. Now I put on my business hat. Now I put on this hat. It's like, I just want to wear the authentic hat. And the authentic hat's like, love me or hate me. That's your own perception. And if you hate me, thank you for clearing up space in my friends <laughs> list. We're good. Cool. I can only take 5,000 on Facebook. All right. I can only have so many hours of my day I could dedicate to phone calls for friends because I'm a pretty good friend, as you know, I reach out. So it's like, cool. You just cleared up the space. Thank you for making less traffic. <laughs> I love that. You know, I talk about, and I, I, I don't know if it's the whole, you know, when you put your attention on something, you see more of it or what, but I'm seeing more people speak up about the void, which is for sure the experience that, that you had. Now looking back on it, right? A little bit of reflection. What do you perceive the void as being in your life? That's a great question. The void is like the breath. Right. I'm not going to go very long if I just keep talking and not taking a breath in between. <laughs> and you're not going to understand what I say if I just keep going like this all the time and I have nothing to do except for really, really talk really, really fast. You know, that works for Buster Rhymes, but it doesn't work for the rest of us. <laughs> he can get away without One day the he's void. He's just going to be rapping so fast. He's just going to pass out because he didn't have a void. <laughs> <laughs> Employed. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> it's just going to totally implode. <laughs> And I think the void is, again, it's the space where we store all of the stuff. It's the space where we get to reflect on all of the stuff. It's part of the being. It's the slowing down. It's the sloth energy. And again, when you take an approach to life as you know, the hare versus the turtle, there's, there's great achievement that may come from that, but it's very fleeting. And for me now, I am full blown embraced in the void. I, you know, I now serve ceremonial cacao. I said, all right, you know, again, I like physical manifestation of anything. So I've got guys like this, my little, my little Cebu here, my little cosmic sloth right? Sit down and watch the pace that a sloth moves. You have to have the utmost patience. It couldn't do anything in the typical 30 second attention span on social media. TikTok right? sloth. Like, that's, right. TikTok sloth. It'd be like this. That's all you would get every 30 second clip. But look at its face. They're smiley. They're happy. Look at the energy that they beam. I think the void is our natural state and, and how do we express it? And that's that, uh, if you were to take a personal development, um, high performance equation, it's stress plus rest equals growth. And if all we have is the stress <laughs> without the rest, there's no growth. So the, the void is the rest. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. It's a yeah, superpower. To, to use a fitness analogy. And by the way, I just have to side note, because you'll think that this is really interesting. So many people have called me fit <laughs> this just like in the past week. So many people have called me fit. And remember, you and I were having this conversation about uh, about shifting, shifting that identity and how I didn't perceive myself as a fit person at any point in my life, even though there was a period of time where I was every single weekend performing and dancing for like four hours at a time. And I was like in, I was in show choir and belly dancing and all of these things. And I just wanted to share that with you because it was, it's a, it's very it's interesting because multiple people have said it to me and now there's like a, a fun embodiment there. 
But anyway, where I was going <laughs> before I got sidetracked, you know. The, the I ADHD, love that sidetrack, though. That's beautiful. Uh, popping in there. It's fine. Squirrel. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, the void. See? Brain farting already. <laughs> 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 use a fitness analogy, right? So many people, when they are working out, right, they're trying to get fit for the first time. So much emphasis is put on, am I doing the right workouts? Is what I'm doing correct? Am I, you know, do I have the right mix of exercises? And how much time am I spending doing all the things, right? When Anyone who knows anything about fitness, you don't have to be an expert, but you know that part of the most, like the most important part is the rest, right? It's you go into the gym, you're tearing the muscle fibers, but it's during the rest that you are then expanding and adjusting your capacity to be able to lift more, to hold more, to receive more, right? Right. That's happening while you sleep, right? That's happening in the stillness, in the rest, in the space. And that is actually more important than am I doing the exact right combination of exercises? Am I spending the exact right amount of time in the gym? So on and so forth, right? It's not that that stuff doesn't matter because it does for sure matter, but also we, get so caught up thinking that the manifestation of a fit body or the manifestation of a successful business or the manifestation of abundance, our dream life, our all of our desires is in what we do when actually most of creation is happening in the stillness, in the pause, in the in the silence before it comes into fruition, right? Or before we do the thing to bring it into reality. You're, you're spot on. And it blows my mind how people chalk all this stuff up as woo-woo, yet are completely tuned in and savvy to it when they are the observer of sports. Oh, we understand when we're watching sports. Wow, LeBron spends one and a half million dollars on recovery. Amazing on his food and on his nutrients and on his rest and all these recovery tools. We understand that with biohacking, we're so savvy to it when we're the observers watching sports. Oh, uh, you know, this guy got injured in these plays and he's on injured reserve. That's great. But that's cool because he's doing all this rehab and rest and now he's coming back for the playoffs and he's incredible, right? We understand the power of energetics in that sense. And the other place that's very interesting is we understand the power of the mind and, and connection when we see all these players go from team to team and go, oh, that guy's a cancer, a cancer to the team. His statistics and his left brain science stuff shows otherwise, and you'll be like, this guy's an amazing player and he's got these great numbers, for example, like a Kyrie Irving, yet we know he goes from team to team to team and he's like a cancer to the team and the teams implode once he gets there. What is that? It makes no sense. Oh, it's the energetics. It's the way he gets along with everybody. So we understand those things conceptually as the observer of sports, yet if we try to apply those things into our own vision of ourselves, in our business, in our fitness, in any facet of life, we go, oh no, that's just a bunch of hooey. It's hustle, it's it's hard work, it's first one in, last one out. And we're like, wait a minute, you understand that when you're observing, but we get brain dead when it applies to mm. ourselves. I love you bringing in sports uh, references because I don't know shit about sports. Like full transparency, my husband, like very athletic, track, football, you know, he's a big guy obsessed with the Eagles. Um, that is not something that I have been, yes, I'm going to get into sports. That's not my thing. However, we had a conversation earlier this week, uh, cause he was going through some, some things with his business. And, and I was like, I'm going to use a sports analogy and I don't know anything about sports, but I understand energetics and that's all I need to break down 
basically anything. I don't need to be an expert on the topic because I understand the energetics behind why certain realities are the way that they are. So I asked him the question, what makes a better football team? The offense or the defense? Now, mind you, I can't even tell you all of the positions on a football team. Okay. So, but I know what an offense is and I know what a defense is. And he said, he responded so beautifully. He said, the offense wins games, but the defense wins championships. I was like, exactly my point. And what we were speaking about specifically was um, him getting very hyper-focused on and, and reacting to some of the things that were happening in his business right now, instead of being able to, you know, lip, come up, transcend that momentary hot mess that's happening, and then look down on the bigger picture and see, okay, what is what is actually necessary so that not only does, does it resolve this momentary challenge, but it actually keeps this challenge from reoccurring again and again and again, and ultimately is what creates that, that long-term success, that long-term um, experience of his business that he wants, right? So I was like, thank you so much, husband. You just gave me some great content about a topic I know nothing <laughs> about. And I'm not going to be creating, you know, a new business on how I'm a sports <laughs> sports coach. But I do understand the energetics of it. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, as we start kind of wrapping up, I feel like the the most common theme that I see I saw it with you and I see it with pretty much every client <laughs> that comes to me when they are faced with the void. There's a resistance to surrender to the process because really for the first time in your life, you don't know what's on the other side, right? Like when you went to school, when you we're getting certain certifications when you were building a certain business, et cetera. You had a certain vision and all you were doing was kind of just following the steps to get to that vision. Right. But when we're faced with the void, we don't know necessarily what's on the other side, which can be the most terrifying piece because you're only from your higher self really getting the next one or two steps. Right. You're not getting the whole picture of what's possible. Can you share with us a little bit of like, what is life? What is life after the void for you? Right. What can you give some glimpse into, at least for you, what what reality you're living now that you just was so beyond your imagination or vision then? Beautiful, beautiful. I, I get to spend the overwhelming majority of every day in a bliss level consciousness. Now, I don't live in a cave. I've got two kids, three dogs, two cats. My daughter's type one diabetic. I get obstacles thrown at me like fish at a fish market. <laughs> They're flying all the time. But in spite of that, I've become, for the most part, unfuckwithable. And what I mean by that is that this smile, which is not fake, it's, it's just emanating, is the state I get to live in most of my day, regardless of the obstacles. And I've learned because of the void and because of my connection to I am them and they are me and understanding our interconnectedness and that there is always everything in cycles and things on the other side, a resilience that isn't all about perseverance. And I will overcome this. It's that true harmony that I realize I get to be happy now. Truly happy now, not a contingent happiness. When I, then I. Because there is never a then I. There is, it doesn't happen. Because what's the when? The when we don't even know. And a quick funny story that uh, actually 
from our experience. I remember there was a moment where I was just begging for some clarity and you had, um, we'll just say, process channeled, downloaded some very interesting insight about my experience. And, and you were talking about the way of being and you're like, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You could be a, a cashier at a grocery store. And it was like, there was part of me that was like, that's amazing. But there was another part of me like, I don't want to be a cashier at a grocery store. <laughs> Please, God, don't let me come out of this having to go work like over at, <laughs> over at Kroger. <laughs> that's not what I'm here on earth to do. Just tell me what it is, but please don't make it Kroger. I don't want to just go serve groceries. Nothing against it. But again, when you have this vision of I am building an empire and then it comes down to like, you know, would well, you want paper or plastic? <laughs> like that doesn't seem fulfilling for me. I didn't want to return back to those pearly gates and have that conversation. So I think the understanding the side of the void, it's like, your own unique individual persona doesn't have to fully die. It is your labels and your constructs and your conditions that need to die. And they are basically just self-imposed obstacles that are standing in your way. And when you realize that all of the obstacles that are there were put there by you, <laughs> then you just go, wow, why did I do that? I was too busy blaming all these people and this makes perfect sense and I could show you exactly why it was all of them. But oh, where did I play a role in all of this? And that is the true joy of just saying like, okay, nobody needs the most perfect easy street. We need the right path for us that is fun and enjoyable and interesting and challenging. And we fall up into the next level of the video game. And for me on the other side of the void, uh, now, I'm at a place where I realize, like, I'm not at the top of the mountain. I physically relocated to the top of the mountains from the beach. But I'm like, there's still more mountains, even higher and higher and higher. There's new levels of opportunity. And to bring it back to sports, the analogy I would use here, which you don't have to know anything about sports to understand. So a lot of people all tune into the Super Bowl, some for the commercial, some for the game. But I can tell you, if only one team showed up and there were no obstacles, it would be really boring. Even if your team showed up and it's there and you're like, all right, I'm great. I'm an Eagles fan. The Eagles are in the Super Bowl. Who showed up? Well, the Kansas City Chiefs couldn't make it today. So we brought out the Pee Wee League of third graders. Hey, you'd be like, oh, my God. And then they take that first hit and the kid goes to the hospital. And you'd be like, oh, this is just this is just awful. I can't watch this game. Yes, they won. But like. It wasn't yeah. fun. Like you have to enjoy the ride and that's mm. really the key. Yeah. I love, I love when people have the realization that whatever it is that they desire, right? The million dollar business or the mansion on the beach or the trips to Paris and Fiji or, you know, the some, sometimes even you know, the ability to live off grid and raise chickens. I don't know. I've been very much on raising chickens lately, but <laughs> not for me. Nice. I'm not raising chickens, but <laughs> yeah. I, there's some people out there that need to just give themselves permission that they want to raise chickens. Um, yep. You can raise the chickens and put them on my plate, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's this idea that when I have that, then I, then I get to have what I desire. But what we actually desire is is a state. It's a state of being. It's a frequency that we can experience now. I want to, people to really understand that you get to have what you desire right now. Like the actual underlying desire that you can have that right now. And when you tap into it, the physical man man manifestation of what it is that you want, whether that be the mansion on the beach or, you know, the land off grid, whatever that is, when you are creating it from the place of I am already experiencing what I desire because I'm in that frequency, I'm creating in that frequency, I'm enjoying that frequency on the journey. The physical man manifestation becomes so much easier <laughs> to come. It, it just begins magnetizing 
to you so much more effortlessly. Not that you won't have challenges or not that, you know, you won't ever have to do any quote unquote work, right? You will still need to take actions. However, you don't have to wait until you get it. And the truth is, is that when you think, when I get that thing that I want, then I will experience the frequency. It never happens. You experience it for a brief second, right? I rem- I will never forget walking across the stage after it took me six years to graduate from college. Okay. Six years to graduate. And I remember walking across the stage, getting that piece of paper. I was so excited. I spent a lot of money to get this. I quote unquote sacrificed a lot to get this piece of paper. I come off the stage and literally by the time I went to sit down, I was like, oh, well, that that feeling's gone. (laughs) (laughs) Like six years. I was, I was making myself miserable. And then I literally got maybe 30 seconds of that feeling. And it was gone by the time I sat in my seat. So I'm just a firm believer that life does not have to be that way. It can be a euphoric state, right? That's why this is euphoric evolution, that you can grow in the frequency of euphoria. And that when you do that, that is ultimately you living your destiny. That is you leaving the legacy that you are called to leave on this planet, right? So with that, I want to ask you, what is the legacy that you hope that you are leaving right now? Hmm. Great question. I will say that legacy has shifted dramatically. Initially, for me, the idea of legacy was all about achievement where people would be sitting back and being like, look at all these great things he achieved and acquired and passed on to my family. Now, the legacy that I want to leave is much more about all of the different ways that I lifted people up and helped them see the greatness within themselves. Everywhere from friends to family to clients and everything, when they sit back And I use this one analogy, which is as I sat back and looked at so many of the different spiritually enlightened humans who've brought heaven to earth, the one thing that I saw in common with all of them was this true joy de vie, this whole like laughing, light, playful energy. And when I saw the statistic that the average child laughs like 400 times a day and the average adult Four, that's the embodiment. That's the legacy. I want people to think about me and say, wow, he really brought joy to my life. He made me laugh. He made me smile. He cared. He connected. And he helped me see the greatness in myself. Well, you are for sure doing that. Make sure that you keep cranking out the dad jokes because... um <laughs> That is making it happen for sure. The cornier, the better. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Extra Extra cheese. Extra cheese, not so cheese. It can even be vegan cheese, but that's all right. It's going to be cheese. All right. So, Kyle, it's been epic talking to you as always. Where can people find you if they they feel a resonance with you, if they want to learn more about you? Where are you hanging out these days? Absolutely appreciate first off every second of time I ever get to spend talking to you. And uh, when we have people listening, it makes it even cooler. But I'll, I'll just say first off, thank you. And the best way to reach out and connect is under Rapid Harmony. So it's rapid.harmony on social media uh, or rapidharmony.com. Before we hop off, is there any last tidbit that you want to leave with? Our listeners? Uh, yeah, you're, you're in the right place. I was very fortunate to connect with Makosi by having a very open mind to like, okay, she is not a what you see is what you get. 
And the more you just open up and connect and befriend and listen to this woman who is so wise beyond her years, mm -hmm. uh, the better your life is going to be. Simple as that. And uh, I make sure we're connecting all the time because I, I don't take it for granted. So anybody listening, there is so much wisdom beyond anything you see with your eyes when it comes to connecting with Makosi. So keep tuning in. <laughs> it's not a waste of your time. Aww. Thank you so much, Kyle. And I appreciate you taking just a little bit of time to share with everyone what your what your journey's been like. And I know that this is going to touch so many people and, and inspire them through your like very lived experience of this process. And I'm so excited to see how you're bringing rapid harmony into the world. I really see it as being number one, so needed, but also so aligned with the full expression of your potential in this lifetime. So it's been awesome to watch and I'm so excited to see it continue to unfold. And with that, we are signing off today and I will see you on the next episode of Euphoric Evolution. Bye. 